much for being here. This is Vintage Update. I am the Grime Minister, Luke Force. And on the line, as always, we have Shotgun Shan, who we'll hear from in just a second. But I just want to encourage all of you to check out our website, WrestlingAudioRevolution.com, for hours upon hours of past audio, current audio, FedCast, Vintage Update, War Weekly, Historical Significance, retro episodes and much much more so check it out we have not done any audio in the last two weeks since fast lane but the most important detail that everybody is always dying to hear whenever you're on the line <laughs> how the heck are you i'm all right man i'm all right you know it's that it's that time of year when you and i we tend to have our shoulders slumped a little bit we tend to be letting out those long sighs uh, as we build towards WrestleMania and we see that things are not necessarily uh, coming together the way that we dreamed. Um, and this year is no different, but there is some interesting stuff going on, and I'm sure we'll get into that as we move forward. They always give us something to talk about, don't they? They do, even if it's just to complain. But yeah, there's there's certainly stuff to talk about this year. Let's put it that way. Well, we'll try not to bellyache too much. We'll try to keep this um, criticism constructive in some way, shape, or form. But, you know, you never know where this thing can go. It is WrestleMania season, and, and like you say, the last few years hasn't exactly been, how do you say, that uh, anticipation that we've had in previous years for WrestleMania. But we'll get to that, of course. Uh, and before we do dive into the WWE stuff, and there's lots to talk about, and I always like to let people in on some of the... Uh, behind closed doors meetings that we have online and, and sort of what the uh, time and temperature has been on the march to WrestleMania so far and the road to WrestleMania. Um, before that, though, I do also want to promote right here on the air on the Spreaker Web Radio Network and at our website at Wrestling Audio Revolution and on Twitter and on Facebook. I mean, we're all over the place. But Ring of Honor will be partnering with New Japan Pro Wrestling Coming to Toronto once again this year, May the 11th at the Ted Reeves Arena. And Shotgun Shan, I mean, you got to give us the uh, update. What's going on with you? You said that this may be a no-go for you this year. I'm still trying to work it out, buddy. I'm going to have to look at the dates and see. Last year was really great. I have to say that without Nakamura there, it doesn't hold the same appeal, but only like half a percent less. It'll still be a great show. And there are a lot of guys that have come up, you know, um, guys like Kenny Omega are, are a much bigger deal than they were last year. Uh, so, you know, if we can get those guys in there, I think it could uh, it could uh, shape up to be just as good. Speaking of which, before we dive into this WWE stuff, uh, you mentioned Kenny Omega. Did you happen to see uh, ROH 4th anniversary? Sorry, 14th anniversary, uh, <laughs> the show that they did recently with New Japan Pro Wrestling? I certainly did. And, um, you know, again, they put out a solid offering. I think whenever you put those two uh, organizations together, you're going to get something interesting. Honestly, seeing Ishii on there kind of gave me the chills. And I was really, really excited to see him and Kenny as well. And the Bucks who do, do uh, double duty across both promotions. So, um, yeah, it was a good show. Really liked it. They had some interesting pairings, didn't you think? Oh, for sure. And that was actually, I don't know if you realize this, that was Ishii's first match in North America. Wow, he did a great job. So, I mean, you mentioned the fact that uh, the King of Strong Style will not be here this year. And, and, you know, it's kind of crazy to think about how much has changed in not even a year. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you can pretty much, I think you can pretty much count on the fact that Ishii will be here in Toronto um, on May the 11th. So that's something that's pretty interesting when you start to think about seeing him live because, uh, yeah, we're big fans of his work. And I really loved that match that they did and actually opened the show uh, against Roderick and Bobby Fish, just because you always will hear these people that really are the casual New Japan fans or even some of their detractors that will say, oh, Ishii, he just hits people really hard. He just takes really hard hits to the head, but there's no psychology and he can't work. I loved that match because it was not that kind of match at all, and it shows, you know, Ishii is a hell of a wrestler. Like, he can go in the ring as a wrestler. Aside from that style, that shocking, hard-hitting style, I mean, he can go in there and have all kinds of different matches. It's just that's sort of been his um, calling card these days. Uh, but I love that. I love that he was there on that show and that, you know, I think he's going to be somebody that's coming over a lot more now. As you say, got to fill the void of Nakamura, which nobody's going to do right now. 
Um, and, but nor should anybody, because I think Nakamura is his own thing. Sure. And he he held an appeal that was so unique. I think you can find something, um, you know, that's going to excite people in the same way. But I don't think you'll ever be able to reduce uh, to reproduce that kind of appeal that he had. It was just he had his own niche, and let's hope that carries over to his WWE career. You're absolutely right, and you're not going to uh, make any carbon copy of, of a Shinsuke Nakamura. Yeah. Um, but there is a new guy that has been rising in the ranks of New Japan uh, since the last time we've been on the air together, and he is certainly something different. He certainly has a niche of his own, and uh, for my money, he was the most overperformer on that 14th anniversary show. And of course, I'm talking about Kenny Omega. Uh, that was an incredible match that those guys had, first of all. I just want to say that. It really was. You know, Kenny's really been one of those guys that it seems like he's just been sitting waiting for Nakamura to move. Like he had that spot kind of carved out for him, but he just couldn't quite step into it yet. Um, it was. He seems to have moved into it with ease, too. I mean, Kenny's got... He's got his own thing, and I, I certainly have um, made a lot of derogatory comments about his hair um, sure. over the years. But beyond that, I don't think I've ever been able to say a bad thing about Kenny Omega. And seeing him now step in as sort of the leader of Bullet Club Elite, um, I think uh, I think he's where he was meant to be. They're a great act. Him and the Bucks yeah. are a great act. It's not, no... a weird, it's not a weird fit at all. It doesn't seem Absolutely forced. Absolutely not. Yeah. And yeah. especially with all the stuff they've been doing, and I do encourage anyone out there to uh, definitely check out their YouTube channel because it's been nothing but laughs and entertainment and smiles. Putting smiles on faces. That's what the elite is doing. Uh, and some of the things that they've been putting up, particularly their press conference, I know you did see that. You've got to have seen that. Oh. Uh, where they launched into uh, the Pink song. Um, Raise Your Glass, which they changed to Raise Your Belts. Uh, these guys are like, uh, you could say the new DX, but DX always to me felt like these guys probably really think they are cool. Like they really probably are thinking, and in those days especially, like, yeah, we're so cool. And then they probably acted in a lot of ways very similar to how they acted on, on screen. Whereas with the Bucks and Omega, it's just so tongue in cheek. Like they know they're so ridiculous. They know that they're so lame and, and, and obnoxious, you could say, and they don't shy away from that. And, you know, that's not what these guys are really like at all. So I always just love that anytime you see those guys together, it feels like the new DX, but in a cooler way because these guys really do realize that they're kind of dorks. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's the thing. That's exactly the thing. They know they're dorks. I mean, the Bucks still look like little boys. I don't know how old they are, but they still have that look like they could be 14. And it works for them so well. I mean, they really seem like obnoxious high school kids, and it makes it really funny. Right, right. And, uh, of course, Kenny, whenever he teams with the Bucks, has to wear those... Those tights <laughs> have a design that was lifted from those candies, those hard candies that used to stick together in Grandma's candy dish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, but, I mean, yeah, that if you want to go and check out the 14th anniversary show, I do recommend it. Um, but I will say this, and I think, Shane, you'd agree with me. The show peaked with that match, and everything that happened afterwards, there was some solid stuff. The main event, solid stuff. But, I mean, the crowd definitely had – the air had been let out of the balloon by that point because that Omega uh, Bucks versus Seidel, ACH, and who was the third? I'm trying to remember right now. I can't even remember off the top of my head. Uh, ACH, Matt Seidel, and – Oh, dude, I'm forgetting. I'm sorry. Anybody, anybody, everybody out there knows. Uh, it's probably somebody really, really dope, and we can't even remember them. So we apologize. But nonetheless, check that match out because it was incredible. But everything else afterwards. One thing I want to ask you, too, just on the ROH tip before we move on. The production. Real upgrade in production to their TV shows now and to their pay-per-views. And uh, this new set that they've got, you no longer have the glaring lights. Just over the last few weeks, I mean, it's really felt like ROH has stepped up and they're in the hunt. It really is. And you know what? At first, when I started watching it, because I've been watching, and this is a compliment, this is not a put down, because I've been watching like WWE and NXT, um, I, it didn't occur to me until you pointed out to me how much better it looked, simply because it almost fit in with everything else I was watching. It didn't have that glaring exactly. drop in quality. Um, you know, so really, when you pointed it out, I went back and watched it, and I was like, Jesus, you're right. It's exactly the same as, as sort of NXT. It looks bright and professional, and they've done a great job. So, Oh, Which geez, is... you know what? Hold on. It was Kushida. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I knew it was oh, another really How amazing, can we forget Kushida? How can you forget Kushida? I know. It's absolutely uh, a, a travesty that we would forget Kushida, but... 
it's just one of those things, you know what I mean? Uh, it's been a long week. Uh, but nonetheless, yeah, Ring of Honor, it's been fun. It's been fun to see them step up their production. They got better production right now than TNA. I know that you wouldn't realize that because nobody has seen TNA. It's like they uh, are, are taking, you know, their, their show is airing on a different planet. It might as well be right now because nobody sees that show. And nobody talks about that show. And I'm sure there is some good wrestling on it, but, I mean, you don't hear about it. Uh, so, ROH, again, enough respect to them. I don't know where the money has come from. I don't know if it's a Sinclair thing. Um, again, who is the group that owns Ring of Honor. Um, and I don't know if it's if it's in-house. But, nonetheless, we applaud you guys. And Ring of Honor, one thing you got to say about them, I mean, they crawl before they walk. They never go too far outside of, you know, what they are able to handle at that time. And uh, again, really cool to see them with a much better production. And like you say, it isn't a far cry from NXT, especially. In fact, it looks a lot like NXT when you watch it now. Yeah. Uh, one more question, though, about that show. And uh, again, we talked about the the Bucks and uh, Omega. And me and Sean on our last show, we really uh, went into detail on the Tanahashi and Omega match where Tanahashi just made this guy with a dis, you know, whatever it is, is going on with his shoulder. If it is a dislocated shoulder or whatever's wrong with this guy, and he's been working through it, um, that guy really made Omega, and Omega walked into that building and felt like a huge star that he would not have felt like a year ago. Um, and if he's coming to Toronto, I'm gonna just empty my wallet right now because I'm a huge Kenny Omega fan. He is a huge, <laughs> he is a huge fan of our shows. I don't know if you know that. I had Kenny, no idea. Kenny Omega gives us nothing but respect on Twitter, and uh, we, we thank him for that very much. Um, to get the cosign from Omega is a big deal, and the followers have just been piling in because of it. So thank you, Kenny, for that. Thank you for the great wrestling. But i got to ask you, Shan, before we move on from that show, your boys, the Motor City Machine Guns, reunite oh, oh, at the 14th man. anniversary of Ring of Honor show, and it looks like going forward they are now a tag team in Ring of Honor. One of my favorite tag teams of all time. Probably my top three favorite tag teams of all time. It was a shame, you know. I mean, at least that they were together during during one of the heights of TNA. So people did get to see, but I don't think enough people got to see them. So I'm hoping on the second time around, I know the guys were a little older, a little wiser. I know sure. that they may not be able to do some of the things they could have done before. Um, but I think a lot of their chemistry had to do just with, you know, how in sync they were with one another and not with a lot of crazy high spots. So um, I think people should really be able to enjoy, I hope, be able to enjoy them, have a good, strong run. That's the way it should be, too. Those two guys should be together. I love them as singles wrestlers, but together uh, they're outstanding. Mm, definitely. And those guys can both still go. They mm -hmm. can both still go. Um, who knows? Maybe we will see. In fact, I would assume we probably will sooner than later. The Young Bucks versus the Motor City Machine Guns. We were pretty much introduced to the Young Bucks through those matches in TNA. Yeah. And uh, the Bucks have obviously come a very long way since the days of being, what were their names? Jeremy and, do you remember? Oh, yeah. What, was, what did they call them? Generation oh. Next. Generation Next. Uh, yeah, Jeremy. Jeremy. I, just... <laughs> I can't remember. Was it Jeremy? Yeah, Jeremy. I mean, if, that's their work name for him. That's their gimmick name. Jeremy. It's, fi it's fine if it's your real name and you don't want to change it. But yeah, exactly. if you're, you're going to pick a name. <laughs> it's it, like Nick isn't tough enough. You need something it, like Jeremy. <laughs> was it Jeremy and Max? Was that what it Max, was? I can't, yeah. Is it Max? Max I can't Buck. remember. Max <laughs> Buck. But, but they were, yeah, their last name was Buck and then their, their tag team was called Generation Next. Anyway. Uh, but those matches, I mean, were, were definitely a revelation for us back in those glory days of TNA, and I think we're going to get to see those uh, again in Ring of Honor. Who knows? Maybe even uh, for the Toronto show there in May. So that's pretty damn exciting. And just finally, I mean, the main event, like I say, was a little bit flat. Um, Jay Lethal winning with a double lethal injection on Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly. Uh, my question right now to you is, who is the next challenger for Jay Lethal in a big match situation. It feels like he's pretty much run through everybody at this point. That's um, the problem. That's do the you problem. feel anybody on that roster or even in the New Japan side of things that are, are sort of a natural fit for another big title defense for him? Because I don't. Well, let me put it this way. The problem with being Jay Lethal right now is that you're just so much better than the majority of the people that you're in there with, and that's not a knock on the rest of the competition. It's just that Jay Lethal's kind of the star now. Total package. He's, he's kind of the total package. He's kind of to that point where you can feel that he's starting to grow a little bit beyond what Ring of Honor can offer. Um, I would say that if Jay Lethal 
continues to to be where he is wrestling the guys he is uh, that he has. I think they do need to bring in uh, more of the Ring of Honor or more of the uh, New Japan guys um, and some more outside talent to bring him in because, I mean, he's beaten all the top guys that are there convincingly. Nobody wants to see him fight Roddy again, although it would be a great match, Roderick Strong. Um, you know, they've done that, and they've kind of shown everything that they can do for now with that. They've seen him beat Jay Briscoe. Um, you've seen him go through everybody else. I mean, I'd love to see him against Kenny, but they're both heels. It could be a really, really good, a really, really good match. But uh, well, that, yeah. that's also once you get into that too, you're also talking about a very political situation. You know, yeah. when you're talking about a top guy from the company uh, against the top guy from New Japan, that's when it gets political. That's when it gets tricky. Not on the guys themselves. Not saying Kenny's going to refuse to do a job, but you know, Kidani might say. Omega's not doing a job because he's our IC champion uh, or vice versa, you know? So that's one of the reasons that people often wonder, and it's very easy to fantasy book. And I mean, in your mind, it's, it's incredible uh, to think about it. Or, or Tanahashi will come in and he'll defend the belt against Tanahashi. That would be awesome. But I mean, then you run into the, the politics of this top guy from this promotion and this top guy from this promotion, even though they're partners, um, you know? So it, I don't know. It, it really is interesting on the Jay Lethal side because I'm just watching that show when it was over, I thought, cool, what's next for Lethal? Uh, Michael Elgin is a huge star right now and, and getting more popular by the day in Japan. But as you saw on that show, when he comes back here, the people still don't react to Michael Elgin. Um, so it, it's kind of a weird situation. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, a few other things. Shan, you've seen any NXT lately? I've been watching NXT every chance I got. I don't think I've missed a show. I have not seen the Balor versus Neville match, but I am getting... To say rave reviews would actually be an understatement. People are saying this has been one of the best matches of 2016. Have you seen it yet? I did, and I thought it was fantastic. I mean, it's what you would... I'm not going to say it, that it's what you would expect in a way that it was uh, somehow predictable. It wasn't. But you can expect a level of um, of excellence from each of those guys. And when you put the two in the ring together, they have a, an amazing chemistry. So Yeah. I'm, I think that that's, that that's a pairing that you'll see periodically over the years. They'll throw those guys back together just because they can pull out something exciting and new. So Sure. And, you know, um, people have made the comparison to the, the Joe versus uh, – what was it? Joe versus Sami Zayn from a few weeks ago. Yeah. They've made the comparison in the way that the match was worked um, because it was not a spot fest. It was uh, almost like an old school – World Championship match or like an IWGP match, I think would be the perfect example. It was like a Tanahashi Okada type of match in the sense that it builds. It starts slow and, you know, maybe for the first half you're thinking, well, this, you know, this is okay, but there's not really much going on. This is kind of a disappointment. And then by the time that the finishing sequences come, you know, you're standing and you're, you're, you're losing your shit. It's, it's a slow burn. And I like that. I like that. I don't think that every single match you have to be, like, worried about the attention span of the audience. You know, you teach them, you condition them. So I've heard this is a very similar match. It is not uh, action, 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 move, move, move. It's a, a slow burn for the first half and then gets into some really uh, some really great stuff. So I'm really excited to watch it. And uh, I'm going to have to check that out on the network sometime this weekend. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. And I would really recommend that you keep your eyes uh focused on NXT for the next few weeks because oh, most yeah. of the stuff that's coming up, they've really got huge talents in there now. And with Nakamura coming in shortly, mm -hmm. I think it's just going to explode. So Now, what do you think of the uh, little package they've put there on the website? So far, that's all they've done, right? One video on the website? I believe so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's fantastic. They're, they're certainly giving him the reverence that he deserves. Yes. They're certainly giving the backstory on him, the background, so you know – not only that he's an established star, but there are so many North American stars that are crazy about him. So, I mean, I think that really gives him some legs coming in. Yes. That it's not just the company saying, oh, he's a really big deal. You've got some of your top guys chomping at the bit to get in the ring with him. So, How um, weird was it to see Vince and Nakamura shaking hands? <laughs> that was pretty surreal, right? It was, oh, my gosh. It was. It was like a spaceship just landed in Vince's office and he was... Well, he seems friendly. <laughs> that was the, that was how he approached him. Um, but it was one of those things. I love too the way that, that Nakamura pronounces his name, uh, McMahon, McMahon, Mc, yeah, 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 Mc, yeah. Mc, Mc, Mc Mahone, or wasn't it like something Mc like Mahone. close, like Mick Mahone, Mick yeah, Mahone, yeah. and Triple yeah, yeah. H. Uh, so yeah, that I mean that was a pretty surreal thing to see. It definitely made it all seem very real, and and it's gonna be a hell of a takeover coming up. Um, one of, I would have to say this is the most anticipated show on the horizon is the takeover show. Uh, have you heard anything about Emma? 
Uh, I know that she got injured, but I didn't know how okay. serious it was. I didn't know if she was injured or if it was just a, a, got knocked out or if there, you know, I'd heard maybe a broken nose even. Um, I, from... I know, I heard Charlotte got a broken nose. Okay. All right. So okay. maybe the... But I know that I know that um, that Emma's injury. All I've heard was that she was hurt. She was checked on by officials. I don't know. Like she was kicked in the head, but I don't know if this is, means that it's concussion or if she just took mm-hmm. kind of a scary hit. So I don't think there's been an update. Nothing that I've seen is, is at this point has said that there's been an update on what her condition is. Now, obviously, Nakamura versus Zayn is going to be. I would almost say it's match of the year, and it hasn't even happened yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> everybody knows that that's going to be an incredible match, and that crowd is. Going to be very familiar with him. It's not going to be a situation where they don't know who he is. I mean, they're going to be ready and they're going to be going nuts before he even... They're going to be chanting his name before the show starts, I would think. Um, but other stuff on that show, I mean, Asuka and Bailey. You know, we were talking about Asuka and, and the unfortunate injury of Emma, but uh, where do you think they're going to go with that match? First of all, that match is going to kick ass. It's going to... It's a difficult situation, though, isn't it? Because Asuka's yes. just so good. Um, and yet it's not... I don't think it's Bailey's time to step down. Right. Um, I really think she has the momentum and she's and I mean, to her credit, along with Balor, but I'd say even more so, she's one of the cornerstones mm-hmm. of NXT right now. She you've, I've never seen a performer with a, that diverse of an audience, um, of, or at least no. that diverse of a passionate audience. Um, so, I mean, all the way from little children to, you know, uh, hardened uh, male wrestling fans um, are all kind of really united behind Bailey. Right now, that fits really well in NXT. I get a little worried about what they do with her on the main roster. Yeah. But right now, I think build her up until she's a force that can't be stopped and then move her on to onto the uh, main roster. So having Asuka take it now, I don't mind if Asuka takes it for a while, but I still think it's Bailey's time. It's also just a bit of a curious... Like, from a storyline perspective, I mean, they're both, like, the two top babyface females in the company, right? Yeah. So, I just wonder, coming out of that match, is it just, like, a, a pin and a handshake and we're moving on? Or is Asuka turn heel? I mean, I, I assume Bailey doesn't turn heel. Um, I feel like Asuka could be a hell of a heel, but it just, she's got so much momentum right now. People don't want to hate her. They they love her. They love when she comes out. They love watching her wrestle. They love seeing her beat up girls that aren't in her league. Uh, they, they and, just... and they've got an awful lot of strong female heels right now. True. To true. be honest, as much as as much as I'm sure you don't like Ava Marie, um, the oh, char- yeah. the character that she plays is a strong female uh, heel. I mean, oh, of she gets the response. And you've got Nia Jax, and you've got um, you know Emma, and you've got Dana Brooke, and you've got all these other guys. So I just think if they were to bring Asuka in, she either has to display some big names, um, or she gets lost in the shuffle. So I think keep her face for now. The reason I say she doesn't get lost in the shuffle is because nobody that you just mentioned, Emma is a good wrestler, but nobody that you mentioned is in her league. I mean, no, Eva, no. Eva Marie is not going to be able to carry a, a big – Eva Marie and Bailey are not going to have a match that people are going to be remembering. No, but let me just put – and this is the only thing I really have to say about about where Oscar's at right now. Ava Marie can communicate her character communicate a her little character. bit, yeah, a little bit better than Asuka can, and that's not a knock against Asuka. Obviously, her her English is improving, but you know, um, I think Asuka's better as a face that doesn't have to say yeah, a lot. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, as a heel, agree. she's got to say more, or she's got to have a mouthpiece. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, I I would maybe disagree just from the standpoint of. Everything about Asuka is just about her facials and her charisma. So if she starts to be really scary and make really mean faces and just be... I mean, she's very good at communicating uh, physically, physically communicating her character. But as you say, I mean, Eva Marie's got the promo. And let's face it, too. I mean, a lot of the reason that that heel character works so well is because that audience despises her. And not in a character way. They despise her in a legitimate way. Yeah. Uh, because she is the Roman Reigns, essentially, of the Divas division and has been handpicked and fast tracked and, and she can't wrestle. Like, <laughs> I'm not yeah. gonna, there's no way on, on this show I'm gonna allow the, uh, sentiment that, that Eva Marie can go in the ring. Uh, she can't. She's not getting better. She's getting worse, but <laughs> they've found something. It's true. That's not a joke. Eva yeah. Marie, I will maybe not worse. There's times that she got better there for a while when she was working with Kendrick. And as of late, she's gotten worse in the ring. Um, but as a character, because they embrace the fact that she's so hated, 
you know, it's really clicked and it's really worked. And she's a great mouthpiece. And and to be honest, you know, you could probably do something with her on the main roster as a valet uh, and, for a, t- a top act, really. And if I can interrupt there for a moment, you Go said ahead. she's she's the next she's she's the NXT Roman Reigns. No, she's not because they won't turn Roman heel. That's what I mean. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they they didn't play. To, they played to to Ava's strengths. They have not played to Romans, and we'll get into absolutely, that in a absolutely but, agree with that. Yeah, but, but I mean, know. her heel heat came in the same kind of way. It yeah. came in the way of them being completely transparent and people seeing through the fact that okay, this person has just been handpicked, and they're just they just like her because she's good looking, and they're gonna make her the face, you know. Yeah. So anyway, um, so one final thing about that show too, Balor, Balor. Where do you see things going with Balor and Joe for this show? Um, I've heard some news today. I don't know if you heard it as well, but they have actually scrapped the idea of uh, Gallows and Anderson coming to NXT, and they're going to be going straight to the main roster. There I was some, that, yeah. there was some new merchandise that sort of Balor had sort of leaked a little bit there um, that said bulletproof on it, uh, the Finn Balor, but then in the middle in big letters it said bulletproof, which actually is a pretty badass name if that's going to be the name they go with for this faction. What do you think of the name? Am I the only one who thinks that's kind of a cool name? I think it's a cool name. I think people are going to uh, sort of initially have a feel a little bit let down, right. you know, that it's not Bullet Club. Right. But I think that passes pretty quickly. I think for, for, for a secondary name, I think that's probably the best they could have come up with. I think it's fantastic. As far as what happens with Balor and Joe now, I'll tell you one thing that's going to happen is it's going to be an amazing match. Yes. They have an amazing chemistry. And they really ended the last one in the right way. So it was pretty exciting and left you wanting more with Balor just squeaking out. That's the way that you have a face beat a monster heel is with it squeak out the wind, yeah. but look, look like they're dying doing it because it leaves you wanting more. Um, and I think it'll be a great match. What happens afterwards? I think both guys need to move up soon. Um, Joe more than Balor. Cause I think Balor again is a cornerstone at NXT, but once Joe's lost to Balor, even unless Joe's going to take the title uh, after Joe's lost to Balor, I think it's time for him to move up and start taking on the bigger guys. I wish they would have put him with Taker this year. We'll get into that in a minute. But yes. um, but I do think Joe's going to outgrow NXT faster than Balor will. Mm, yeah, that's it's going to be really quite the fascinating thing to watch because, as you say, both guys are ready. Um, Balor, I mean, he's not getting any younger. Like <laughs> he He's ready. It's time. There's money to be made with this guy. Um, there's a void on the main roster of fresh faces and, and guys that can go. Um, so... I don't know. It's weird because I've heard with with Joe that they had really some plans to bring him up after Mania, but maybe those have changed. Balor, for the most part, I've heard was just going to be staying in NXT and sort of be the face of NXT. But if uh, Gallus and Anderson to come into the main roster, I actually have a, a thought about these guys that I'm going to hold until we get into the WWE stuff and the Shane stuff. And then, matter of fact, why don't we jump into that right now? I'm ready for it. Uh, Fast Lane. We're not going to review the show, obviously. But uh, in general, the way that things turned out on that show, do you wish to get into that? Um, well, I mean, I think we need to get into the whole thing because obviously the ending was, as of the main event anyway, was what everyone had predicted. Um, that I'm more interested with the next night and mm-hmm. I'm more interested with how it all shapes up in its overall, you know, the way that the Mania card is show, is shaping up. I mean, there's some good and there's some bad. Uh, where's and, Where's the good? The good. I mean, I'm. The women's match sounds like it's going to be fantastic. True. I'll give you that. I will say that. I will say that the yeah the Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch, Charlotte. Now we say Charlotte got a broken nose, but I don't think a broken nose is going to keep her out of Mania. Um, mm-hmm. uh, that sounds like it's going to be a great match. Ambrose and Lesnar is intriguing. Mm -hmm. Um, simply because you're putting two really volatile substances into one match. Well, three, if you include Paul, Mm -hmm. and it really is still very, very fresh. And it's been the most organically interesting thing they've done um, um, on WWE TV lately. And when I say that, I just mean that it's been based more upon the personalities of the two characters coming together. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I, I will say those two are good. Uh, uh, what's the other matches? That, I mean, other than the Shane match. Well, let's get into the Shane match. The okay. Shane and uh, the Shane and Undertaker match. I love Shane McMahon. I of all everybody. The McMahon, everybody does. Did you hear the reaction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of all the McMahons, he is my favorite. Yep. <laughs> that's not saying much. No, that's actually not fair to Linda. She's my second favorite, just simply <laughs> because she, simply because she's so inoffensive. But uh, you know, Shane is definitely my favorite. But I just you know. It's that time of year where I sit down and go, I think, just before they begin building to WrestleMania, that little kid in me goes, 
we're about to start the new <laughs> yeah. era. We're about to start the new era yes, of WWE that we've been waiting for for like oh. 15 years. <laughs> because there's never been a period in WWE history, at least not recent, of the sort of modern history, where there's been so long between distinct periods in WWE programming. This has been a long, drawn-out kind of mushy, uh, you know, started with Cena, seems to still be ending with Cena, uh, a few false starts and and quite a few um, kind of suppressed uprisings with, you know, Daniel Bryan and different guys like that, uh, where you felt like something was happening and it didn't. And um, so we're moving into that. And we're now seeing that one of the main events and certainly the most highly billed match is going to be the Undertaker and a guy who, again, all the respect in the world, is at the end of his career and needs to be really looking at every Mania match as his last, is wrestling against a guy who was a part-time wrestler 15 years ago. I just, to me, it says, it screams from WWE, we've, we've given up. We don't really care. We want to make some money. We don't really have any plan to do much else. And I think we talked about this off screen. It's all fine and good to kind of pull in a, a, some crazy names to try to make a big pop for WrestleMania and get people watching. As long as once you get people watching, you showcase the, the real talent and the talent that's supposed to be pushing the company forward. For the past four or five years, that has not been the case. They're bringing people in with matches with, you know, Rock and and now Shane and uh, Taker and, and and guys like this trying to get a big uh, a big viewership coming in and then really not using that to do what you need to do. I always think WrestleMania is pushed as the biggest show of the year. You need to stack up that card with guys that you want to present as the next big crop of guys. And as much as they talk about it, it just ain't happening again this year. It just ain't happening. No, it's not. And it's not happening next year, and it's not happening the year after. It's not happening until until one of two things happen. Something happens financially for them mm. where they have to get serious and reinvent the fact that they've that, – well, the, despite the fact that they've wiped out all their competition and have no organic competition anymore, where they actually have to somehow pull themselves up and compete – you know, against ratings, you know, really trying to bring in that interest, um, you know, for, for some real desperate reason. I mean, the, the thing I really miss the days when Vince had guts. He doesn't have guts anymore. And if he was here, I'd say it to his face, not to be belligerent, but really he used to look at what was happening around him and react to it. These days, he's become, it's like in the old days, it was like a, a master yachtsman on a stormy, stormy sea where you had to turn with the waves and you had to follow the motion of what was going on. And it was also organic. If somebody hated a guy, he was hated. It didn't matter how much money he made for you. If he was hated, you turned him heel and you made them really hate him. Um, but now it's like that, that, that master yachtsman on a stormy sea is now just a guy in a mega, mega yacht that can just drive through the waves. It really doesn't make any difference anymore. He can just look over his shoulder and go, oh, well. Not really a big deal. And just go ahead with whatever he was doing. It's, it's of course, his right because he's a company owner. But that dynamic quality of the programming is gone. It's now just we're just going ahead with what we're doing and to hell with you. So, mm -hmm. I mean, perfect example. Um, Royal Rumble 1994. Bret Hart and Lex Luger go over the top rope at the same time. Their feet hit the ground at the same time. It's the first time ever there's two winners of the Royal Rumble. The backstory being that Vince wanted Lex Luger. From the moment he saw Lex Luger, from the moment he signed to the WBF, the uh, World Bodybuilding Federation, <laughs> yet another failed non-wrestling uh, venture from Vince McMahon, by the way, which is kind of funny that people don't tend to really bring that up. They just talk about the, the business genius that he is, and, and they never bring up the fact that any time he tried to do anything non-wrestling, it failed. It yeah. failed. And this goes back even before, you know, the rise of WWF. So um, it's like it's it's a weird thing because with Vince, uh, he he wanted Luger. Luger wasn't getting over. He was it wasn't Roman Reigns because it was a different time. You didn't have the Internet. You didn't have all that stuff. But still people knew and they sensed that Luger was the chosen one even though he really was not that interesting. He really couldn't cut a good promo, uh, although a lot better than Roman, but again, he didn't have a script. Um, and he was not over the way Bret Hart was. But there was an internal thing there where you had the guys like Pat Patterson saying, Vince, listen, listen, 
They don't want Lex. They want Brett. And Vince being like, well, you know, it basically was a compromise of let's have two guys win. Whoever gets cheered the most is the guy we're going with. And anyone that ever saw that pay-per-view, I know we watched it live. And, I mean, it was very obvious that night, and it's very obvious in hindsight, that Brett was a lot more over than uh, Lex. And Vince, even though it was not what he had in mind, even though he had different plans, he wanted the big jacked-up bodybuilder with the, you know, action figure physique, he had to just look himself in the mirror and say, you know what, they don't want it. And, you, I mean, you don't have that anymore. You're right. You don't have that anymore. And Roman Reigns, it's now been 13 months of this, 13 <laughs> months of this, and we're still going with it. And, I mean, this might as well be um, a rerun of this podcast because, I mean, we've been talking for 13 months, and it seems as though nothing has really changed. Um, but regarding Ambrose and Lesnar, uh, I would agree with you that it's the most intriguing thing from a character standpoint. I don't understand what they're doing with, with Ambrose. Um and I guess really the thing, too, from the the Monday show with Shane was uh, the Triple H stuff at the end, which carried over again this week. How do we how do we rationalize this one? Uh, I, I, I find it very explain. Very... And even if you could just explain the last two weeks and what has happened there, because maybe there are people listening to this podcast that uh, don't know what we're talking about. But Triple H and and sort of uh, his presentation. Well, I mean the whole the, the, the whole quandary behind this, the whole query that I have is, if I mean I keep hearing that they don't have plans to turn to turn Ambrose heel, and that's you know I, that's that's fine. I would rather that they keep him face for a while because I think he's so over. It's really fun. Um, but they seem to be having this really convoluted, distracted. Um, booking system around Triple H, Dean Ambrose, and now Roman Reigns, who's almost forgotten for the meantime, um, while a while H is in there with um, Ambrose. Now, they're fighting on the network show. That's right, right? In, in Toronto. In Toronto. And this is, like, this is a big, they're pushing this as a big deal. Right. Um, and it really just seems like almost subconsciously the focus is shifting away from Roman and Triple H. Um you know, and I'm I'm fine with that. I'm I think that uh, first of all, I think that Triple H and Ambrose is going to be a great match. Um, I, for just again because it's fresh. And that's really I think, despite the fact that 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 Roman and Triple H haven't really had matches against each other, um, it still does. It seems stale already. Uh, Ambrose and anybody seems amazing. The fast lane main event baffled me because you had a guy who you're desperately trying to get over and is being rejected, and you put him in with the two biggest faces in the company, the two guys who get the biggest, craziest reaction. I scratch my head all the time. I can't even put it into words. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, it, it was confusing going into it. It was confusing watching it. It was confusing after the fact. But they just don't care. I guess it's the only way to put it. And, and they can't seem to make up their mind if Triple H is the face of the heel. Um, oh, and that's kind of what I was alluding to there, with uh, especially yeah. with with the other week, uh, last week. Yeah. Um, I don't know what was going on. I don't know why you would go out there and do the crotch chops and do everything. And like you say, I mean, you brought this up in our Facebook talk. You know, uh, the the head spot on the announcer's table. Yeah, pounding, the counting. Head. Yeah, yeah, getting the crowd to count along with you. Um, yeah. it, I mean, if that was accidental, if he just banged his head against the table a couple of times and heard the crowd chanting and counting he would stop if he was playing the heel he didn't he just kept going he's like oh yeah we'll do the 10 count i'm like oh my god and i just can't figure out if there's some madness behind some some genius behind the madness or if it's again just that ego just that ah oh, getting the reaction keep going i don't know i don't understand it and i some good things are coming out of all this but there's an awful lot of confusing stuff going on around the main event and i don't think that's how you want it to be i don't think you want your world title to be in in a convoluted not mysterious and interesting and intriguing, but just confusing kind of setup. And that's really what we're up to now. Just watching it, you know, with just not knowing anything about the backstage of it, but just watching it as a fan. And you and I have both been fans for many, many years, many decades of this company. Um, fans, and I put that in, in very loose terms, but <laughs> but we still <laughs> follow this product and we still cover it and we still do a podcast about it. But you can't help but feel, especially with the, the Reigns thing last week. Like, Triple H took advantage of that guy. And he knew, the re he knows what kind of um, relationship Roman Reigns has with the fans. And he just saw it as a very easy way to go in there and swoop in and make himself the star. 
and even the the baby face in this. I don't understand this, Shan, because all, from Vince to Hunter to Steph, everybody was in agreement from the moment this guy was getting called up that this is the next John Cena. So this isn't something where this was forced upon him. This isn't something where this guy should be trying to sabotage anything. Whether he is or he isn't, I don't understand it. But, I mean, they're going to go through with this. I don't get the feeling watching it like Roman's not going to win the title at WrestleMania. I certainly don't get the feeling like Ambrose is going to win at Roadblock and we're all of a sudden going to switch the card up with a, in a couple weeks' notice. Um, do you see that? I mean, if they did it, it would certainly be exciting, although we'd lose Yes, Ambrose, it would be the right decision, it? but do it you feel be, like they would do no, it? No, I don't think that they will. Here's what I kind of speculate. I kind of wonder if H is an awful lot smarter than Vincent and Stephanie. And as this thing is developed, and he's seen that it's not going to work. Instead of arguing, he's letting it play out and said, you know what we'll do? We'll have him fight me. Oh, and I'll get the title. And I'll get the title run. And then, you know, and I just kind of wonder if maybe he's just kind of sat back and said, this isn't working, but it can work for me. And he's it can just work take, for me. Yeah. yeah. And he's just taken what he can get as sort of a last hurrah, because he's got to know, not just from the from age and the physicality of it, but simply because of the, the high level of of um, responsibility he has now with the overall product, that this is probably his last hurrah. And I guess maybe he's just riding it for all it's worth. I don't know. That's that's all I can think. Yeah. And then we saw the stuff with Ambrose where, you know, Ambrose basically picked a fight with H and much like, well, I guess it was even cleaner this time. I mean, he just, H just beat him up. It wasn't like he jumped him. He didn't get him from the front. He didn't do anything. He just beat him up in a fair fight, and he gave him the pedigree, and it was just like, wow, like, like you're just going to run through everybody here. You're going to run through the two top baby faces and Ambrose. I mean, one thing that I think everybody's probably in agreement listening to this show, I can't imagine anybody's going to disagree with this. Although this is only the setup match for WrestleMania, it really, you can't help but watch these segments and be like, oh my God, Dean is so much better in this role than Roman is. He is like like leaps and bounds better than Roman Reigns in this role. And yet this is only the setup match for the, the friggin' mannequin that comes out there and cuts promos named Roman Reigns. And I know that there's people that, you know, are going to say, well, that's, it's not Roman's fault. And I, and I totally get that. And I think Shan, that's even been your tagline. Whenever you'll, still, you'll say something about Roman and you'll say no fault of his, I'm going to disagree. It is a fault to not have charisma. It is a fault to not be able to cut a convincing promo. That is a fault. Okay. But let, let, let me, let me counter that. Ambrose is getting a script too, and he's oh, able to make it work. I agree. I you agree. Know? And you know why? Because Ambrose has a quality to his personality that works either side of the face heel, uh, face heel line. Roman Reigns at this point is where Rocky Maivia was when the fans were, were not, I mean, they're not chanting die, Rocky die, that intensity. Okay. But different he, time too, right? But, but, but a different time, he's where he was. And instead of giving him an out and saying, you know what, you're going to make a fantastic heel. Poor Roman, his only experience as a heel was in the shield where he never had to talk and that was his thing. And he was intriguing back then and they liked because him. he didn't talk. And they liked him. Yeah, and the fans liked him. And, and they liked him because he didn't have to talk. The other guys had the personality. To take Roman to this point and not let him loose as a heel, where he would actually have something to say, is a crime. And it's actually sad to watch. I do feel sorry for Roman. It's not his fault and I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. It's not his fault it's that not he's his, not. No, I agree with that. It's not his fault, but it is not, a, it is a fault. Okay, let me say, it's not his fault that he's not a good face. I will say that right now. Any really good face, with the exception of Ricky Steamboat and a few other guys, have gone through own um, kind of honing their character as True. a heel first. Roman has not had that opportunity, and I mean, so it's sad to watch him flounder, seeing. That really just an, a little bit of effort in the other direction would uh, do so much for him. And he could become that guy they wanted. He really could. John Cena was a good heel before he was a face. I mean, so you can't say he's going to be the next John Cena if you're not going to give him the opportunities you gave John Cena. It's true. It's when you turn Cena heel and you gave him that rapper character, that's when it took off. And that's where the momentum began. And that's, and that's where the charisma came from. That's where the charisma came from. He was just a dude in tights, you know? Right. And you know what's funny about Cena, too, and, and people don't necessarily remember this when they start you know, reflecting on the history of John Cena, is that John Cena didn't come into that company as 
this is our guy. This is the next guy. Let's push him. He's going to be on the charities. He's going to be this and that. John Cena almost got cut. He almost got cut. It wasn't until the Vanilla Ice uh, segment there on SmackDown for that Halloween party where they saw anything in him. You know who did see a lot in him? Paul Heyman. John Cena is a Paul Heyman guy. He's not a Vince McMahon guy. He was a Paul Heyman guy. Paul thought he was incredible. He saw all kinds of personality. He saw all kinds of potential. Um, WWE was going to cut him, and it wasn't until they gave him that opportunity to be a heel, to be the, the annoying rapper character, that they even got on board with him or that he even got any kind of fanfare. So... Again, yeah, it's a very – whenever they say that, that this is going to be the next John Cena or this is the next John Cena, it's like there is no next John Cena, first of all. There is no next John Cena on this roster that I see when I look at the at the roster. If there is one, it's in NXT, and her name is Bailey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I look at the, at the main roster. I don't see one guy that I say, okay, this is the next John Cena. I see the next – or the only Kevin Owens, or the only, uh, you know, who, who AJ Styles, or, or this, that, the third. Or Sa- Sa- Sami Zayn, I could Sami see. Sami Zayn. Sami but- Zayn, I could see being the next Daniel Bryan. Not yes. in, in that comparison, but I think he's going to hit that same hit that same mark, and I hope that they really take advantage of that. But here's the thing. You can't have the next John Cena when you've still got John Cena. Right. No one's going to get that place. You can't pretend that this is going to be our next guy because he can't take that spot while the guy's still in it. So you really need to develop something different. Cena's not going to be around forever, but I think he's going to be around for a while longer. You always need to develop something different. And again, that's what I'm saying, is that you can't just say this is the next John Cena. Lex Luger was supposed to be the next Hulk Hogan. Guess what? He wasn't, because there is no next Hulk Hogan, and the only thing you could do is go in a different direction. Uh, You couldn't do that again. You couldn't repeat that. Um, Then you had Brett. Then you had Sean. And, I mean, those guys didn't do the business of Hogan, but then a guy came along. That was nothing like Hogan, but then became like the biggest thing in the world, and that's Steve Austin. Austin and and, uh, and Hogan were like the two biggest guys, and Rock. Those three guys are nothing alike. Nothing alike. That's three completely different characters. And two of the three were happy accidents. Exactly. And they were desperate. I guess that's something that also needs to be, you know, really hammered home is the fact that in the Rock and Austin time when they made those stars – and they took over, and they actually were able to put WCW out of business and buy WCW. I mean, those guys came about by – it was necessity. You know, they had to make somebody. Uh, and they just happened to be the right guys at the right time with the right promo and the right potential and the right work. And everything just clicked into place. But again, like Austin, Rock, Hogan, those are not the three same guys. Those are three completely different things. And – Roman Reigns is not John Cena. He doesn't look like John Cena. He doesn't act like John Cena. He's not as charismatic as John Cena. He, you know, he's nothing like him. So it's just, you are trying to shoehorn this guy into something that he's not. And he hasn't had the John Cena experience. He has not had the John Cena process. So there's absolutely, yeah, exactly. There's no point in drawing a comparison. There's no point in pinning your hopes on a guy that you're not going to allow to go through the same the same process that the other guy went through. It's like they decided it. They decided they were going to protect it so much that it hasn't grown. Roman's kind of a stunted little plant right now. He hasn't really been exposed to the elements, and he hasn't been allowed to really thrive the way that he should. And I just wish that for good or for bad, somebody would look and go, not working, let's try something different. They did that with Rock, and it was the whole reason that he ever became what he was. Um, and, and I would love for them to see that, too. And with Cena, too. They just gave him something different, let him go, and kind of let things work out on their own. And I, just for Roman's sake, I mean, I don't think there's very many people I feel a deeper sympathy for in the world of wrestling right now than Roman Reigns. Because it's got to suck to be being told by your boss that you're the greatest thing ever and being told by the fans that you're not. And that's got to be a really strange, strange situation to be in. Right. And there's somebody listening right now that's going to say, well, that's just the hardcore fans. Um, and I will even play that card at times when it's necessary to play it. But the bottom line is the ratings are at an all-time low right now. Yeah. So it, you know, it's not you know like what? you can say, oh, but the bigger picture. Because he's not selling like massive merch. He's not moving the numbers on the ratings. Uh, nothing's really changing. Uh, in fact, they're going down with Roman Reigns in this role. So. But you know what else? And I'll say this, and you can talk about you know that the, the live crowd is, is not representative of the uh, the greater audience but i'll say this perception is reality absolutely 
And when you see a guy fall flat on TV, no matter how much you might like him, after a while, you're going to get that feeling that you're kind of a dope for following him. When a guy is, and it's not like he's getting a huge reaction and it's one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And it's not like people are, you know, you're getting this, let's go Cena, Cena sucks. He's not getting that. He's getting either flat, he's getting a pop when he needs it, and he's also getting booed. So there's not. And he's also, he's also getting this. Yeah. He's Silence. Getting nothing. Silence. He's getting nothing. And that's and, when it hurts. And that's that is and perception is reality. So that keeps up for too much longer. And even the people who are supporting, we're going to start to feel like they're being duped. Um, and that's where I think it's headed unless they do something different. Yeah, no question. And, you know, that can work the other way, too. I mean, WWE for a long time, they've made a habit of when we go to someone's hometown, let's humiliate them. Let's yeah. make sure when we're in. Jerry Lawler's hometown, for instance. I know now you don't have a whole lot of sympathy for Lawler, but still. Uh, let's make sure to humiliate him and have him lose. Because, again, that's the best thing to do when you bring a guy into his hometown. You can get a little heat for somebody. Uh, the, the, the bottom line is, when you have somebody in their hometown, and Lawler's not a good example for this. Best example to me, I think, would have been the Jericho and Benoit push that happened um, right around the mid two thousands, a little bit earlier than that, around that time when they were a tag team, and it was like they were—you could really tell. Now they're feuding with Austin and Hunter. Like now it's on. These guys are getting elevated, and they had those Raws um, in Edmonton. I think they may have had one in Calgary around that time too. And these guys got like a hero's welcome, a hometown hero's welcome. And I just remember watching it and being like, if you could just keep building on that momentum, the people at home see that, and they may not even know that these guys are from Edmonton, but they just see the crowd going completely wild, and you need to book them to be heroes when they come home. Um, but WWE didn't do that. I mean, they still don't really do it now. Um, and they should. They should, because like you say, perception is reality. And you could just, a light bulb can go off in your head. A switch can be flipped from where you thought, okay, this guy's all right. So you see him in a certain building with a certain reaction, and all of a sudden, you know, you're buying into it. You're buying into the hype. Um, and I just would love to see them find ways to utilize that more to where you're able to have the audience's perception make somebody bigger than they are, you know, and, and actually build on it from there. So I completely agree with you on that. And again, I only play that card when I feel as though it needs to be played because, again, I don't know. It's a, I mean, it's a worldwide audience, um, but at the same time, like you say, you can condition them simply with a crowd reaction, and I'll tell you one thing, when you have these dead crowds that you have for Raw a lot of the time, uh, that certainly isn't helping anything. Now, one thing I do want to say about the Shane match, and maybe we can talk a bit about that um, before we start to wrap this show up a little bit here, uh, the thing about the Shane match, and I know that there was like the one week, I think it was the Shane week, where you and Sean were very, very negative about it. And to the point where you're even like, you know, what are they going to do? They're screwed, and, and they can't put Roman and Hunter last and, and, and whatever. And uh, I, I may have talked you guys down off the ledge a little bit that week, and then it's funny because one week later I was the one writing the ranting things, talking about I hate this company and all this stuff. So you guys had your week of being mad. I had my week of being mad. Regarding Shane uh, coming out, I thought that was really great. The segment itself um, – I thought that it came off really well on TV. Crowd was, like we say, perception is reality. Crowd was absolutely insane for that. And Shane is extremely likable. That's not just something from you or me or just the fans. Shane is the most likable McMahon, period. To the point where I think some people really feel, because of that, that you know Shane would have been a better choice to run the company than Stephanie. We don't know anything about that. Shane does not have a history of necessarily being a very successful businessman. He's tried for a number of years since he's been gone uh, to get the whole pay-per-view thing take off in China. It, it's not happened. He's lost a lot of money. Um, so we don't know necessarily anything about Shane as a businessman or a book or anything, but we get the impression from him that he's a, a good guy. And that is enough reason for a lot of people to say, you know, Shane should have run the company and he would have been the best choice again, because he's the most likable. Um, so do you want, I, you want to know another reason why I would say that? Go ahead. Because, because one thing that Shane had going for him, even though, as I said, he was a part-time wrestler 15 years ago, 
when he did wrestle, it was exciting. He took crazy spots. Not that I think it was wise to do that, but because he was working part-time, I think he'd get away with it. But he was a very exciting wrestler to watch, or a wrestler with air quotes, um, yeah. to, to watch when Sunday. he did it. So Roman, so sorry, Roman. <laughs> so, so Shane, Shane coming in and running the company and having more of a presence, I think really you would have been excited when Shane came out because he wasn't going to strut down to the ring like Vince and blow his quads. You knew that if he got in the ring, he was going to do something probably exciting. And I think that he would have held something else as a performer in that way. So when you see him coming back now, I get a little bit of a charge. I'm like, oh, Shane, that's awesome. But then you have to remember he's 46 now, isn't he? Mm -hmm. I, I, and he's in against Taker, who's, like I said, got to be looking at the end of the career. It makes me nervous. But I am excited to see him. My, my, you know, my criticism is more that too much of the focus for WrestleMania has gone to that match, which really has nowhere to go, other than the stipulation about... Shane taking over Raw, which I guess leads to another brand extension split, whatever, which, I God, I hope they don't do. Really? Uh, You're against this? Uh, no, I don't want to go back to that again because they're not – SmackDown is not where Raw is. And when you send the guys to the B show, then all those guys have a mark on them. I don't want to do that again. Just just build both shows up, use all the talent, and give people lots of time on TV. Shit. Be I got a challenge on this one. And and that's totally understandable, and you gave great, you know, back you back those points up very well. But I do have to ask you: Don't you get flipping sick of seeing these guys? Don't I get sick of seeing them? Yeah. Don't but you I... get sick of seeing the same guys twice a week, and then sometimes three when there's a pay per view? Because I know I do. And okay, when but... I when I hear people that get upset about people being brought back for WrestleMania, oh, he's a part timer. I always just think to myself: You seriously want to see the same guys again? Because I just am tired. I'm tired of seeing them. I see him for three hours on Monday. I see him for two hours on Thursday, and then I see him for three hours on Sunday. I, right. I, I like the idea, to me personally, and I totally understand what you're saying. And SmackDown is by no means, uh, you know, at the level of Raw. It's gotten a lot better, but it's by no means at the level of Raw. But I just look forward to maybe being able to see a different group of guys but i don't think you will because what i think will happen is they'll split that brand extension they'll decide who their top guys are on both shows and those guys will just be on the show a lot more so you'll have a lot more exposure of the same guys spread across two shows um and still the guys that are at near the bottom are still going to have to struggle to get on tv i don't think it's going to help anybody that's true. That's true. I mean, you bring up a good point. I don't even know if I'm for it or not. I just know that the idea of seeing different talent on different shows um, definitely is something I would be open to open to considering for sure. Um, the whole thing with Shane, it wasn't even just that the fans like Shane. Yeah. They saw Shane coming out as hope. Well, you know what? It was a McMahon and it wasn't Vince or Stephanie. I mean, that's a plus right there. Right. Something's um, happening. But, I mean, that that reaction and the way that the crowd went nuts, it was hope. Because it was like they woke up. They woke up out of this slumber that has been the last few years of WWE. And they at least had this glimmer of hope of, oh, my God, maybe we will get something different. Now, I don't know if we're going to get something different. Uh, the match itself, I mean, if you're judging on match quality, you're absolutely right. This is not going to be a good match. Uh, I do think it's going to have a lot of smoke and mirrors in it. I do feel as though at the end of the day, it's going to be a pretty memorable match. Uh, and I wonder who is going to be involved in this match. I mean, how do you even figure this one goes down? How do you think? I mean, the way that they've built it up, and it's very curious to me because all I hear about is that Shane is back as a uh, TV character until WrestleMania. And then he's going to go away. And that he's not working with a contract. He's just working on a handshake with his dad. And... Um, and that this has nothing to do with him coming back and actually being involved in running the company, which is a shame. And that he uh, will not, again, will not be going forward after WrestleMania. But if that's the case, with this stipulation, it's just going to be that Shane lost and he can never come back and hold anything over Vince's head again. That's a dreary ending to a match. And I don't see that happening. Uh, so any way you look at it, I don't necessarily think the match will be anything to rate. But the reason I guess I'm not totally against it is because I feel like I may get a little closer to what I want out of this product, which is a baby face uh, authority figure and, and, and not the McMahons all over my product. Not the same thing we've been talking about, about the old magic carpet and sweeping it from under the guys. Anytime they get anything where they've accomplished something, they're just going to sort of stack the deck against them. I, I don't know that this is going to happen, but you have that glimmer of hope that it's going to happen. And I think that's why people are interested. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I've gotten more 
um, comments. I've gotten more messages. I've gotten more texts from people that don't watch wrestling saying, what's going on with Shane? Is he coming back? Is he taking over? Like Almost like, is it okay for me to watch again? Do you think this might be something that where I can start watching wrestling again? And I agree. You know what? I'm on board for that 100%, everything that you said. My my and, and my complaints really are not about Shane being on the show because I think yeah. Shane knows how to entertain, and it's going to be exciting. I just think the placement of it on the card is going to be more is going to be higher than what it warrants, mm. and I think that the fallout from it is not really going to be what what we might hope. I don't think it's going to push the product forward, and again, I don't think it's going to be used to springboard anybody that needs it. You can't make stars if you don't give them a platform, and I just don't think this is going to result in anybody new being made. Let's just put it that way. And that's really my criteria these days. Like I said, I think Vince has lost his guts. I'm waiting for the next era. I sit through this this time period around WrestleMania, before and after WrestleMania, when they roll out their new guys, and the built WrestleMania, when you see who's going to get showcased. And every year I go, is the new era starting now? Who is it? Who are we going to build this around? And, you know, every year it just seems to be we're going back to the same old guys. We're going back further into the past for guys that are further past their prime and we're not building who we need to build and then making those stupid comments about people not reaching for the brass ring. So mm -hmm. you know, I think we're in the same position this year, no matter what they manage to pull out with, with Shane and Undertaker, I don't think it pushes the product forward other than, as you said, would be nice to have a, uh, a face authority figure. Well, I just also feel, and again, there's really not a lot of reason for us to have faith, but then again, WWE, when it comes to WrestleMania, I mean, last year we were saying the same thing. This show's going to be a disaster, etc. I mean, we we said it all last year, and they managed to pull it off. They pulled something out of it, and when WrestleMania was over, people were talking, and we we were optimistic about the future with Seth Rollins cashing in and, and everything. It seemed as though by the time WrestleMania ended, we all felt like, okay, cool. I, I'm not I'm not going to miss tomorrow's uh, Raw. You know, this is something where I'm, I'm okay. I'm hooked. I'm still in. Let's do it. Um, yeah. And this year, I feel as though when all is said and done, it will be. I don't think this is going to be a dud. And I do feel as though for the short term, you will see a change. And for the short term, you will see some guys made because I think Shane is going to come in and he's going to take over Raw and he's going to push a new crop. And, I mean, who is the new crop going to be? I can't tell you exactly. Something inside of me, and I really don't know what's going to happen for the finish of this match. We'll have to wait and see how it's all played out. They certainly didn't give us much this week regarding The Undertaker and why he's going to be in this match. I mean, I know that Vince is the um, he's the matchmaker, and he can just put the, the meanest guy in there in his match, and it will stack the deck against Shane. Um, but when all is said and done, I don't think Taker's going to be a heel in this match. Which tells me at the end of the day, he's going to somehow let Shane win. And how that happens, I mean, uh, it's it's too hard to book. But I mean, as much as it sounds maybe not so appealing, the old lay down finish and drape the guy over you, I think there's a way you could do it. But if you don't do it, is there a chance that, you know, we see a group of new guys involve themselves in that match? Uh, to me... I feel as though the Bullet Club debuting in that match wouldn't be a huge stretch. Uh, for some reason, too, I can't tell you why, and I don't think it'll be in that match in particular. I feel as though the Shield are going to get back together at WrestleMania. That would be a huge, huge benefit. That was a faction that I think uh, got broken up far too early before they kind of played themselves out. I'd love to see it, but do you take, you know, t at least two top guys in, in Rollins and Ambrose and kind of a damaged third in Reigns and lump them all together. I mean, who do they, how do you book those guys going forward? I don't know. I that they're united to, you know, get rid of the authority, I guess. Um, I guess. Rollins coming back. I mean, I feel as though he's coming back as a baby face anyway, the way that they set that whole thing up. Uh, I certainly don't anticipate him coming back as a heel. I don't know when he's going to be back. But uh, just something inside of me is like, well, we've got to try something different with Roman that gets the attention off Roman, gets people to warm up to him again. And when, how did they warm up to him before? They warmed up to him when he was in the Shield. And I really see no reason why that faction can't get back together. They cut that babyface run way too short. And what that means for the world title, I don't know. Maybe you have them... You know, inter interject in the Roman versus H match. Maybe there's a bunch of interference happening on the H side, and uh, the Shield ends up coming down and you know evening the odds. And that's the way that you don't have people shitting on the finish of that match is because the Shield's in the ring and people love the Shield. 
Uh, there's an idea for you, WWE. If you're looking for something and you're bound and determined to have that match go out last, there's my that's my uh, way of booking that match. Because I think The Rock, if you just think you're going to have The Rock come in and give the uh, people's elbow to Vince, and that's going to make up for it, and everybody's just going to be happy and forget that there's this uh, sniff in the ring named Roman Reigns, I don't think that's going to work. But the <laughs> Shield, the Shield, I do. I do think that might be a bit of a foolproof way of having the fans be excited at the end of that show that Roman Reigns, you know, was able to conquer Triple H. But again, I don't necessarily think that'll be something involved in the Shane match. And that is very curious how they're going to book that. How do you have Taker lose? Because again, the idea of just Vince winning this one and now Shane can never come back. I mean, that's certainly not going to make the fans happy. Uh, and not in that, like, oh, I'll pay my money to because I'm so pissed off and I want to see you get beat up. That's really just a tap-out kind of angle. You know, you do that, you get people excited, and then you say, well, nope, and we're never going to do it again. No, that's that's not going to happen, I don't think. I think Shane's going to end up winning. He's going to end up having control of Raw. And I do think for the short period of time, it's going to be a shoot type of thing like you saw during his promos where he brings up the ratings and he brings up all this stuff. And he's going to say the things that we're saying, and he's going to say it's time to push new talent. We're going to start pushing the Kevin Owens or whoever. I mean, whoever you, he's going to bring up guys. Let's bring out Samoa Joe. And and uh, Shane is going to be sort of the feel-good story uh, post-Mania. So I guess, you know, that's really the only thing I can feel optimistic about the whole thing. And that's why I didn't necessarily shit on it is because the end game, I thought, well, this could be better than what I'm getting. Now, it is WWE. They have a track record. They have a track record of ruining things. They've done it over and over and over and over and over again. Will they do it this time? Who knows? Maybe they'll turn Shane heel, Shan. Maybe they'll turn the McMahon family babyface. Maybe that's what this Triple H thing is all about, and him beating up uh, Roman Reigns. Maybe it's going to be babyface Triple H against heel Shane McMahon. What do you think? Do you know what I have to say right now, my friend? And I do not want to burst your bubble in any way. It feels like we've switched roles because I seem to remember <laughs> at the past two WrestleManias, I was speculating on all the incredible things that would happen after. Ah, oh, it's gonna, this is gonna happen. It's gonna change it. We're gonna do this. And you were like, no, dude, dude, that's such a stretch. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, you know what's gonna happen. And I was like, no, it's time. It's finally time. <laughs> and now we, and now I'm sitting here just, you can't see me, obviously, but I'm just shaking my head, smiling with a smile on my face, but going, the poor boy. But you that's just... why I'm saying short term. <laughs> you, you, you can't rule out the idea that short term this is what they're going to do following <laughs> I, WrestleMania. I, I can, I can rule that out. Why? I'm not going. I'm not going to. But I'm going to say because you, we know the personalities involved, and we know how little they care about doing anything different. I'm all for it. If that happened, if even if even twenty percent of what you said happened, the the product would leap forward in a huge way. But I'm jaded now, and I'm just going to say I don't think I don't think they're taking their hands off the uh, the cruise control they're on right now but let's cross our fingers well we'll have to do that and uh i guess we'll wrap this show up it's gonna take a long time to make sense of this whole thing and again i'm not saying that everything is going to be a bed of roses after wrestlemania but i do feel like the immediate future right after wrestlemania now they may screw it up by the first pay-per-view and don't <laughs> don't don't rule that one out for sure but i just feel like following wrestlemania shane is going to be bringing a bit of happiness into the people that have been, you know, so jaded for so long, even you, my friend. But, <laughs> but I have no reason to stand out on, on a, you know, I have no reason to, to be out on a limb about this because this is WWE. This isn't my product. This is your product. You are as in you and Sean. Uh, this ain't my product, okay, folks? I'm just saying maybe we should be a little bit optimistic. It is WrestleMania season. And uh, I don't think it's just going to be the status quo for WrestleMania. I think they've got something that's going to happen in that Shane Undertaker match. It's not just going to be a flat wrestling match with Undertaker then pulling Shane over. I think you'll see something in that match. So that, that's my opinion. But I, don't I, certainly, I certainly hope so. The potential's there. Let's just say that the potential's there. Will Shane yeah. take a death-defying fall? Yeah, let's say that he uh, will. Yeah, he will take, he'll take a horrible, some kind of horrible. That's his whole thing. That's, when you look at Shane, his whole thing. like honestly, why? The, what, what else does he do? The dance? He's done the dance already. Do we, are we gonna do the? Are we gonna do the? We has to do the flying jump. Those are the two things you think of when you think yeah. of Shane. It ain't, Maybe, it ain't the punches. No. It ain't the punches that got Shane over. Let's put it that way. I, I got it, buddy. No, 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 no. I got it. It's the return of the Mean Street Posse. Pete uh, Gas. I think so. Right now, <laughs> he's getting ready. And what was it? Rodney and what was the other guy? Joey Abs. Oh yeah. 
They're all ready. They're all ready. That's that's what they've got planned for post WrestleMania. Is the Mean Street Posse and the Shane mean McMahon against again. against the Authority? <laughs> against the Authority. Oh my that's man. the match, folks. <laughs> how how far are we till WrestleMania? How much time do we have? I have no idea. Like I say, this isn't my product. I don't know. You gotta tell me. I don't know, man. <laughs> you don't have it circled on the calendar? There's There's a, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few weeks left. Let's see what they can do. They have the potential there. I'm watching it for Ambrose and um, Ambrose and Lesnar, if that's what ends up happening. Yeah. I'm and watching it for that. should be great. I don't know about the way they've been booking Dean, but yeah. I like the match. I like the I match a lot. I don't think anyone's really expecting Dean to go over Brock, but if there's a story behind it, maybe they will. But still, I think that for straight up chaos, I think it's going to be a match of the year candidate. Sure, so. it's it's a it's a strange mania. I mean, there's no way around it. And uh, I don't know if we're going to get some crazy ladder match. I mean, it feels like a lot of guys are going to end up there because I don't see where AJ ends up. I don't see where Jericho ends up. Um, I don't think, especially now that they're Y two AJ. Uh, <laughs> you know what the weird thing is. If- Take, imagine, imagine that all those guys hadn't gotten hurt, and that Cena was booked, yeah. and Seth was booked, and all these other guys that were missing now were booked, and they booked the matches. Here's what it feels like: they had a plan for everything, then those guys were gone. They cut it out and started gluing weird crap into the spaces. Yes, that's how we ended up with what we've got right now, and that really is a glaring, uh, glaring message to them to say you've been relying too much on a very small bed of guys to carry your product. If nothing else, take a look at this WrestleMania and what you've had to resort to and really work on bringing the talent pool up to, to have a, a wider group of guys that the fans really, really are invested in. If Absolutely. nothing else, look at this year's WrestleMania and say the weirdness of this WrestleMania is a result of, of you not doing that. Man, hopefully they'll learn their lesson. Yeah. Uh, you know that Stephanie's kids and, and Hunter's kids and Shane's kids – uh, I mean, they're going to be doing the same thing in 20 years on this product. I don't, I don't <laughs> doubt it at all. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, uh, we'll have to again follow the whole build to WrestleMania. And uh, this week's Monday Night Raw certainly didn't do a lot to build WrestleMania. But we'll have to see. We'll have to see how the Toronto show turns out. I know a few people that are going. Ernest Matthews, I believe, has tickets for that one. Ooh. So we'll have to get maybe him on the show and give us a. Uh, report from in the building of how how things were there uh the show itself i guess they've now given brock bray wyatt instead of luke harper so my dream match isn't going to happen that's too bad and i love bray but i was looking forward to luke honestly i was stretching out bray wyatt for later but i think luke harper has that weird that weird move set and he's kind of he's a big he can shock you and i really think he he would have really done something great against brock I, i yeah i agree i agree um I'm hearing now that the entire Wyatt family will be in the Andre the Giant Battle Royal. What? And that somebody will be elevated, made. Something will happen involving the Wyatt family. I think you know which one I'm talking about. Yes, that one. So <laughs> that's another. That's another reason why Ray I'm Wyatt to... and uh, Braun Strowman main event of la- next year's WrestleMania. What do you oh, think? Oh no. Well, <laughs> can you believe it? This is honestly what I'm hearing, Shan. It's going to come down to Bray Wyatt and Braun Strowman. And so they're going to move Braun out of the They're going to move Braun already. out of the Wyatt and have him be oh. the top baby face. He's oh going to take over Roman's spot. Oh, no. Anyway, we'll have to see how accurate my sources are. But it, I, I feel can, queasy. I, I feel like I got it. the flu. I can see it. Did you ever wonder why Shawn Michaels uh, dropped the belt to Psycho Sid that one time? When, when it seemed like it was just such a strange decision why sid why now i thought this was you know things were going fine with sean i mean vince panics man he put sid and the undertaker in the main event of that wrestlemania and had austin in the rock or austin and hitman tear the joint down and and, and i mean that match the main event of that of that wrestlemania couldn't have been flatter but it was all except because- people always remember that that sid had a small accident in his trousers <laughs> and that's really i mean that's sh- that's that that's, that's, it wasn't a shitty match <laughs> begin with that summed up <laughs> that summed up the match really right what happened in the match well vince. yeah that yeah. sums up vince yeah. he panics and he pushes the big guys and it will happen again so maybe that means uh ryback will get a push after all the big guy oh, the what's big going on guy. with your boy ryback before we get out of here what the hell is going on well don't, don't necessarily refer to him as my boy ryback <laughs> okay because i like ryback and I, I mean i know let 
I have weird. I have a weird opinion of Ryback. I, I think there's a lot of potential there. I think he's a far better talker than most guys in his position. He's a very interesting, funny guy. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what's going on there. I think they just can't quite make up their mind. I think they know they've got something, but they don't know what they've got. And I'm not sure Ryback knows what he's got either. Um, so I think they're trying to figure out the puzzle there. But I, I don't know what's going to happen with him. Is he damaged goods now? Can you do that much with him? I don't know. What's with the What's with the Goldberg gear? I don't. Know. Why do they? Why would they stray back towards the Goldberg gear? Is Goldberg <laughs> coming back? Is if Goldberg he, coming if back? If he is, I would hide if I was Ryback because I think oh. I know how that match is going to go. It's going to be the Ultimate Warrior versus Hunter Hearst Helmsley, WrestleMania 10, brother. And and, and or 12, of course, should I say? And of course, somebody gets elevated to that match too. So <laughs> exactly. And if if only they could do that. If only they could use this little bit of attention they have with Shane coming back to elevate. Somebody to make somebody, but we'll have to wait and see. Again, we can't really judge before we see it, um, but it does not seem particularly hopeful. Now, we're going to get out of here, Shan. Before we do, just very quickly wanted to say we dedicate this episode to the life and times of the great Hayabusa, Japanese legend, FMW legend, um, who passed away this week. And, uh, I mean, a very sad story here, but also a very inspirational story. Um, FMW, for those that don't know, and that's where he came from, uh, FMW, Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling. Uh, it was really the catalyst and the inspiration on ECW. But any way you look at it, Onita created the death match, and his promotion was FMW. He ran the promotion in those days, and, I mean, that was what Paul saw, and he formed that uh, business relationship with them. I mean, that's how you got the guys like Mike Awesome in ECW. That's how you got the guys like Masato Tanaka in ECW. And uh, even Hayabusa and uh, Jin Station Saki, who WWE fans, WWF fans will remember as Hakushi. Uh, they did appear at the one Heat Wave 98 show uh, in a match against Rob Van Dam and Sabu, which, due to some severe jet lag, was not one of uh, Hayabusa's better showings. But nonetheless, I mean, this guy was extremely innovative, extremely popular. Uh, there was even a time when FMW didn't even have television, but they still drew like 50,000 people for their big show. FMW was around sort of in that tape trading era. So if uh, you look at the WWE roster right now and you look at a lot of the wrestlers right now, they really came up in that early 2000, late 90s, early 2000s, tape trading world, the beginning of YouTube, all that stuff. And Hayabusa was, especially because of the distribution deal that FMW had here in uh, North America with Tokyo Pop, uh, they had their DVDs like in stores. Like you would see them in HMV, you'd see them in Walmart and whatever, FMW tapes, which is kind of crazy to think about. And uh, Hayabusa, the innovator of the Phoenix Splash. And when you think about the Seth Rollins match that he had their last uh, Royal Rumble against Brock Lesnar and John Cena. And I had a lot of people that were getting at me saying, my God, Seth Rollins can do a corkscrew moonsault. And they'd never seen this move before. This was the very first time they had ever seen the Phoenix Splash. They don't watch New Japan. They hadn't seen Kota Ibushi, who also uses that as his finish. Um, and they don't realize, like, Hayabusa created that move in the 90s. This guy was as much of uh, an innovator ahead of the game as you can get. A huge star, huge money draw, and um, unfortunately, you know, 2001 was an awful year for wrestling, not just because of the collapse of the business in North America with WCW and ECW going out of business, but uh, it was also the year that Hayabusa suffered a very serious injury in the ring doing a cabrata, which North American fans will know as the lion salt. And if you've seen Hayabusa and you know a lot of his moves, I mean, that was not one of his more risky moves you could say but unfortunately uh and he later said that he was it was not the move itself but that he was extremely exhausted in that match and his exhaustion was the reason why he didn't execute the move properly landed right on his head and and was paralyzed in the match uh, and then later that year fmw went out of business uh due to some really shady business dealings um involving the yakuza the the japanese mafia um they had borrowed some money this was post onita Arai, A-R-A-I. But anyways, this guy took over for Onita and uh, had some real hard business trouble, fell on some hard times, borrowed money from the Yakuza. Uh, their top star, Hayabusa, was paralyzed. And then shortly after that, uh, Arai, he ended up killing himself because he owed so much money to the Yakuza. And uh, FMW really did go out of business in, in kind of a, a very tragic way. 
for being so influential. Um, and uh, Hayabusa, he had been over time, you know, beginning to, to learn to walk again. And just recently, last year, in fact, um, he did appear for the very first time on his feet. And he came down and it was a lot of his peers in the ring. Um, Keiji Mudo, the great Mudo was there. Kenta Kabashi, um, many others that were in attendance that day. Jin Shinsaki, also known as Hakushi. Uh, and they were all there gathered to see Hayabusa walk for the first time in like since 2001. And in front of a, a, pack, a packed house, he was able to get out of his wheelchair and walk to the ring. And I mean, this is something that's being shared a lot right now on, on the internet and on social media. And I mean, it's about as an emotional a scene as you will ever see. It is grown men with tears pouring out of their eyes, both in the ring and in the crowd, women crying. Uh, it was a very, very touching moment. And if there's one word that you can really use to uh, describe Hayabusa, it would have to be courage. Because again, this guy came and he walked down to the ring uh, it was just something that I think people thought they would never see again. So if there's a story to be told here, I mean, it's a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale about the style. There's no doubt about it. Um, it was a simple move that he messed up that caused the injury. But at the same time, I mean, it was one that he'd done a million times. And it goes to show how dangerous, you know, that style is, even the most simplest of things, especially when you're exhausted. Um, but the guy never gave up. And again, it was it was such an amazing video to be able to see him walk down to the ring. Uh, and again, just it's a very, very emotional. Um, so don't take it from me, folks. I'm just going to read you a few tweets here uh, from some very popular wrestlers. And I'm sure you will know, uh, remembering the great Hayabusa that did pass away this past week. Uh, he was suffered from uh, blood on the brain. I've been hearing all kinds of things that he had a fall. I've heard that uh, he may have had a stroke. He had been in good health from a lot of people that were uh, talking uh, about him since his passing that, that knew him very well and said, it, to their knowledge, he was in good health. But anyways, Mick Foley, who did spend some time with Hayabusa, said, R.I.P. Hayabusa, a wrestler, an innovator, a hero. Um, Natty Neidhart, at Nat by Nature, thoughts and prayers to Hayabusa and his family. His style of wrestling was ahead of his time, a true pioneer and innovator. Um, Sammy Zayn, truly saddened to hear of the passing of Hayabusa this morning. A great inspiration to me and many of my peers. His legacy will live on. Kenny Omega, at Kenny Omega Man X. Very sad to hear the passing of Hayabusa. Easily one of the most inspirational junior heavyweight wrestlers of all time. Uh, the Young Bucks. Hayabusa and Liger inspired us to wrestle in Japan one day. Hayabusa influenced a lot of the high flyers you see today. R.I.P. Bubba Ray Dudley, very sorry to hear of the passing of Japanese ring warrior Hayabusa. Glad to have met him, R.I.P. And uh, Sean Waltman, X-Pac, ex extremely sad to learn of Hayabusa's passing. Rocky Romero of um, Rapungi Vice fame, you know, uh, Forever Hooligans fame, excellent wrestler. Rocky Romero said, sad, the great Hayabusa, a man that influenced my generation with his innovative style and his determination outside of the ring was inspiring. Chris Hero. Surrounded by his peers, people inspired by him, people who loved him. This is amazing. Talking about the video that I spoke of there where Hayabusa walked uh, down to the ring with a cane for the first time, again, since 2001. Um, Samoa Joe, RIP Hayabusa, the memory of the Phoenix will rise and inspire the warriors of the future. So these are just a few of the tweets. A, a very inspirational, a very influential wrestler, both in and out of the ring, and he will be, be greatly missed. And again, the innovator of the Phoenix Splash, the innovator of the Falcon Arrow, which a lot of people will remember Bob Hawley doing, uh, again, in the late 90s in WWF, but that was a move Hayabusa invented early in the 90s. He comes from that whole era, that class of junior heavyweights of the early 90s that really shaped, if you're a fan of that fast-paced, hybrid style of wrestling, guys like Jushin Liger, guys like Hayabusa are the ones you need to be paying tribute to, paying homage to. Because, again, they really shape the future, and uh, he's going to be greatly missed. Go and check out his stuff on YouTube, and we just want to say R.I.P. Hayabusa. So from myself, from Shotgun Shan, we'll be back again in just a little while. we got a super show coming in two weeks. Myself and Sean Cunningham and Shan, Shotgun Shan, and we'll be talking in sort of the up-to-date on what's going on with this build to WrestleMania. So from myself, anything you want to say before we get out of here, Shan? 
No, sir. I think, you know, I'm just glad that we took that time to talk about Hayabusa, who I mean, is such a hugely influential guy. And as you said, like, as jaded as I am, I'm still glued to um, the news board here, figuring out more and more about what's happening towards WrestleMania. And I think you might have inspired me to to let a little sunshine in in this build. I'm going to keep uh, I'm going to mm-hmm. keep my my eyes open and my heart open going into WrestleMania season. Don't blame me, folks, if this one doesn't turn out. <laughs> but uh, all right, well, from myself, from Shotgun Shan, we want to say peace, love, wrestling, audio revolution. New Japan Pro Wrestling number one, ROH Wrestling number one. Dragon Gate, number one. PWG, number one. WWE, 